to continue with the Hallel, I, I guess, uh, for, lack of, for lack of better words and better expression, uh, maybe just for a moment, uh, for those who didn't hear, uh, uh, Chaya Weber, the Ainama's daughter, passed away last night. Very, very tragic. If I could just, if, if, um, if through our discussion tonight, if we gain a greater understanding for how to praise Hashem and for how to connect Hashem, that should be a schus uh, for the entire Eimer Mishpacha. Rabbi Rebetzin Eimer worked so much to help us as a seaboard connect with Hashem in so many ways. If, if we grow a little bit more tonight, that should be a schus that their Mishpacha should be able to give many praises to Hashem for many wonderful things in the years to come. Okay. Um, if you're in the Art Scroll English, it's page 634. 634, we're in the middle of the paragraph of Lolanu. We're really near the end of the paragraph of Lolanu. Uh, the, the mark for, the, uh, for where the Tzchazen uh, begins, that, that little, whatever it's called. Um, Yisrael B'tach Vashem. So, the first part of the paragraph was talking about the fact that we say to God, you should do good for us for your own sake. Not, not really for our sake, but for your own sake. And you should recognize the fact that we serve you with such sincerity, unlike all those other people who worship idols and, and, and things of that sort. And now we say, Yisrael b'tach b'ashem ezram maginam hu. They are klal Yisrael, the entire Jewish people, this is in the tzivui form, have faith in God. He is their help and their protection. And the Radak says that the pshat is that the past history has indicated and proven that God is the help and protection of cloud Israel. So look at the fact that through all the generations, Ezra Maginam Hu, that he has been a source of help to us, he has been a source of protection to us, and based on the past, continue to betach Bashem. Continue to have faith in God. Base Aaron b'tchu v'ashem, as Ram Maginam Hu, the house of Aaron, should have faith in God. He is their help, he is their protection. Yirei Hashem b'tchu v'ashem, as Ram Maginam Hu. Those who have reverence for God should have faith in God. He is their help and he is their protection. So we get the first verse. The first verse was that all the Jewish people should have faith in God. We can get that. If you say the second point is people who have maybe a more close relationship to God, the Yirei Hashem, those who have reverence for God, have some kind of, some kind of special faith in God, maybe, what, what's the significance of Beis Aaron? What's that about? So the Radak says that the Pshat is that the Kohanim and the Leviim in general, which is even though really only the Kohanim come from Aaron, but the Leviim are related to Aaron, they're the ones who are able to devote more of their lives to the service of God, so it's very possible that they have, let's say, a more meaningful connection, or a more uh, regular and intense connection, maybe is the better way to say it. So those people, we kind of address them in, in a unique way, that they should have their own unique faith in God. And then what's really interesting is what's referred to as those who have reverence for God. So one shot the Radak says is, you know, the first... The first, the previous sentence was people who are born into some special group like Kohanim and Levium. You know, but you could have Kohanim who are not so focused. You could have Levium who are not so focused. So Yirei Hashem is people who, based on just their own lives, not because of, you know, what family they come from, just people in their own lives. These are people with great reverence for God. Another chat that the Radak says, which is very interesting, is Yirei Hashem, those who have reverence for God, is a reference, is a reference to people who have reverence for God uh, in any nation. In other words, not just the Jews. That, that's an interesting thing to think about. And Rashi actually says that what it means by those who have reverence for God refers specifically to converts. That those people, it's, it's, it's a whole uh, category of connection and recognition of God in its own right. Uh, you know, in a, on a very lofty plane. They made this decision to come unto the tent of God, the Jewish people, on their own. And that's a whole other category of connection and faith in God. Okay, now let's go on. As we discussed last time, even though in the Sidurim this looks like another paragraph, this is actually <coughs> an extension of the paragraph that we're in. Um, the idea, again, just very, very briefly, basically the rabbis wanted to take something off of the full Hallel, and in this paragraph and in the next paragraph, they've said, you know, if you focus on the second half of the paragraph, you have the main gist. 
And I, I just want to point out, I don't know if I was supposed to quote someone or not, so I'm not going to say it in someone's name, but a person made a very good point to me last time, which is that the first part of this paragraph, Lolanu, talks about the fact that we connect to God and we're different than the idol worshippers. Hashem Zechronu Yivareich talks about the fact that God should bless us and really just focuses on us. So it's an interesting thing to think about, though the chapter in Tehillim does draw a contrast between those who believe in God and those who don't believe in monotheism. The greatest core concept is that we should worry about ourselves and not, not be focused on the shortcomings of other groups and peoples and things of that sort, which is, I think, a worthwhile idea. Okay. Hashem Zechronu Yivareich. God should bless our memory. A of, I mean, we're used to the phrase, but when you think about it, what does that mean? If you want to say God should bless us, that's fine. And that's what the next phrase is, he should bless this group of Israel, he should bless that group, but he should bless our memory. So the Radak says that the meaning of the phrase is God is always remembering us. We believe that God is always thinking of us. And as he continues to think of us, he should always be blessing us. It's an interesting way of thinking about the phrase. Okay. Yivarech has Israel, he should bless the house of Israel. Yivarech has Aaron, he should bless the house of Aaron, a, a subset within the house of Israel. Yivarech Yirei Hashem, he should bless those who have reverence for God. Haktanim im Agdolim, whether they be small or great. This might be referring to age, it might be referring to level of reverence for God. Um, the Radak says a nice idea that he should bless the lesser people on the, whatever, on whatever the ladder is of, of connection to God, he should bless the lesser people in the merit of the greater people. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, by the way, you can totally see the symmetry between the end of the first part and the beginning of this part. The end of the first part is talking about, you know, that the, this house of Israel, this house of Aaron, and these people who fear God, this is what we're talking about now here too. Um, I want to point out that blessing, we've mentioned this certainly before, but blessing is a very fuzzy term. What does bless really mean anyway? And on its most literal level, blessing means to increase. That, that God should, should help us be successful and that just everything should go well for us. And on its most literal, we should continue to increase in number. And now we really kind of branch out in that direction. Yosef Hashem Aleichem. May God add to you Aleichem. Upon you and upon your children. Um, if you think of the very existence of Cloud Israel through all the generations, through all the trials and tribulations, if you think of the very existence of the Jewish people as somewhat of a miracle in its own right, uh, this paragraph is a very beautiful thing to think about. That God's always thinking of us, God's always helping us, and God should just continue to do so for us. Bruchim atem l'ashem. You all, all of you people that we just referred to, Israel, specifically the house of Aaron, those people who have reverence for God, you should all bless God. You should turn around. He should bless you, and you should see him as the source of all blessing. Osei shamayim v'aretz. The one who created heaven and earth. Hashamayim, shamayim l'ashem. The heavens... The heavens, those belong to God. The ha'aretz nasan ibn Adam. But he gave us the land. I mean, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing in so many ways. I mean, obviously we believe that God continues to judge us. But so much of what happens in this world is really up to us. Um, there is a concept of Bechira. There is a concept of free will. Uh, we can do <laughs> wonderful things. We can do terrible things. You, if you think of the very concept of reward and punishment, even though reward and punishment recognizes that God is, is making decisions, in essence, reward and punishment recognizes that God's making decisions as a response to what we're doing. Uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself. We, 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 there was a class last night, and it, it, we referred to a verse. It says in the Pasuk, Yaakov chevel nach that Yaakov literally translated, is the rope of God's inheritance. You could understand that as, as Yaakov is like the thread of God's inheritance. That presumably is the shot. But Rav Chaim Friedlander has a very interesting idea. He says that the Jewish people, really all of mankind, but particularly the Jewish people, are like a rope. 
What does a rope mean? So if I'm holding one end of a rope, and you know, the people at the tables are holding the other end of the rope, so if I pull this way, that affects the rope down there. And, and so our whole existence in this world is this rope connection with God. You know, if we do something good, that has an impact on what God's doing. And if we do something bad, that has an impact on what God's doing. So, I mean, this is all up to God, of course, but he creates the world that way. Shamayim, shamayim la Hashem. The heavens are his, but for the son of the Adam. In so many ways, he really gave us this land. But this next couple of sentences are really difficult to understand. Lo the lo poyo de tuma. Those who die cannot praise God. And those who descend into silence cannot praise God. Okay, that I get. That's true. Every moment of life is, is, is an opportunity to praise God and appreciate God. That certainly is true. But the next sentence is very difficult. And we will bless God forever and ever. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that you're going to live forever? If not, how do you understand the reconciling of, the set of the previous, this with the previous sentence? So, I'll tell you what the Radak basically says. The Radak basically says that the Mason, the dead, that are referred to in the previous verse, are people who didn't conduct their lives in the proper manner. So, people who didn't and again, we don't know who those people are. It's not, we shouldn't be spending our time trying to figure out who those people are. That's God's department. But conceptually, people who didn't use, utilize their, their time in this world in the right way, in a sense you could argue they were Mason, they were dead, while they were walking around. So those people did not praise God in this world and will no longer have the opportunity to. But people who maximize their opportunity in this world and saw God in this world, their neshamos, their souls, can continue to praise God even after they leave this world. So the people who are sort of the walking dead, so to say, aren't going to be able to praise him. But we who are praising him now, the very fact that we're praising him now is the guarantor that we will be able to continuously praise him forever and ever. An interesting, interesting way of thinking about things. Um, and haluka, and so for the last, the last word of the chapter is so praise God. In other words, thinking about that, get to it, <laughs> and then and that that that's basically basically how the Radak explains these last two sentences. Um, so again, just to summarize, then we'll open up for any questions or comments. Th this last section was just reflecting on the tremendous bracha that God brings to the Jewish people, and the tremendous opportunity we have to be human beings, and specifically human beings who believe in God, living on this world. And that we have to praise Him. And if we spend our time appropriately now praising Him, our souls will be able to praise Him forever and ever. Any comments, questions? Nancy. I always thought um, that the, the, the sentences that say, the dead do not praise God, and the, you know, and, but we will praise God, I always saw it sort of as Hashem, as sort of a request. Hashem, keep me alive. Because if you, if you let me die, I won't have the opportunity to praise you. That's certainly reasonable. That's certainly the, the and, and, and notwithstanding what I'm about to say, that could still be the pshat. The, the thing that I think makes it a drop more challenging, you know, the Radak is not a fanciful parish. You know, it's the Radak is pretty, right. pretty, you know, to the chase, you know, pretty, pretty basic. The fact that we say may Adolam, we'll praise him for not from now and forever. It's like, what are we saying? God, let me live forever. What? what you know, that's not the way the world works. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I so that's the challenge of it. But it could still be what you're thinking. But that that's the that's the reason why it's not obviously what you're saying. Doctor, in my mind, Manachim meant that we the living right not that we will live forever but we who are living will live. and whoever is living at whoever any juncture living, that, that could very well be right, right. that could very well be that, yeah that, that ties into what I yeah thank you I
Yeah, the neighbors were discussing this. Said, That's not fair. That's said, next time we're changing the subject before you come so that you don't know what to Thank you very much. Thank you. Aaron, did you want to say something? Uh, the point that you said earlier about looking at Lo HaMesim Yahalu Yavalofei as talking about people who, like in this life, aren't making the right choices, I, I thought that maybe that could come out of the fact that we're comparing the dead to your day Duma, those who are actively descending into silence, which is the opposite of phrase. That meaning it's an active descent. It's that Very going interesting. Down and choosing to go down. That's a fair, I, I, it's a fair, I just, if I may, I just want to repeat it because I'm getting one or two curious looks. I think it's a wonderful point. So the second to last verse, so those who have died cannot praise God and also not those who go down into silence. To be yoreid is an active form. It's not those who have fallen down. <coughs> it's those who actively go down. So there are some people who spend their lives praising God. There are some people who actively spend their lives keeping their mouths as shut as possible in this regard. And, and it's like the, the difference between climbing the ladder and actively descending, if I understood you correctly. It was an interesting point. Thank you very much. Last comment before I we go on. I think I'm continuing with the thought from back there that an alternative understanding. Anachnu is a comment on the eternity of Beit Yisrael, Beit Harabon, Yirei Hashem. That <coughs> individually we may die, but the people of Israel will continue to praise Hashem. May I tell you? Thank you for sticking up for this side of our call. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I wish you and I were neighbors, but I'm too far from Shul. Okay. So, um, um, continuing. Uh, so now 116, and again, this is the part that if it's not a day that we say the whole hollow, we skip this section. But this is the beginning of the, of, of the next paragraph. Rashi suggests that this next paragraph was composed by David after Shaul died. We, of course, know that a major part of, of David's life was his fleeing from Shaul the king, who considered David a rebel. And um, obviously, when Shaul died, this was a point of great relief uh, for David. He was saved. Ahavti I'm, I'm going to just translate the words literally first, but there's something that has to be connected or, or explained or something. I have loved that God will hear my voice, my pleas. So it's just, it's already strange. I have loved that he will hear. A little bit of a strange wording. So the Radak says that there's something missing. The way to read the Pasuk is, I've always loved God. It's almost like Hashem is missing after a hafti. I've always loved God because I know that God is always listening to my, prayer, to my prayers. That's, that's how the Radak says it. Um, Rashi says a hafti is not, not ahava as much as ta'ava, of a desire. That's I've always hoped that God will listen to me. That, that's how Rashi explains it. Um, the Malbim says something really interesting. I, I just love the idea of talking to God. Regardless of what's going on in my life, regardless of if I have some great trouble or if everything is going fine, the very opportunity to speak to God is something that I love. That's how the Malbim explains the verse. So again, Radak says the Pshad is, I love God because I know he listens to me. Rashi says the Pshad is, I've, I, I, I've hoped so many times that God will listen to me. And the Malbim says, it's not I love God. I love the fact that God listens to me. I love just talking to him. It's an interesting perspective. <laughs> Which, by the way, if, if you're talking about hollow, if you're talking about praising God, to be very candid, many times we look at prayer as somewhat of a chore, somewhat of a burden. It is very difficult to find prayer meaningful on a regular basis. The very concept that we can pray and we believe that God listens to us is a remarkable thing. It's really a remarkable thing. And, and, and that, in its own right, is something worthy of giving praise for and giving thanks for. The, the idea that he should be listening to me right now. Ki hita osno li that he tilted his ear towards me, uviyamai ekra. And in my days, 
I will call out. What does that mean, in my days I'll call out? I mean, the point is, I, I call out, why do I say in my days? So the Radak says, the Pshat is, in all of my days, I always call out to God. I've never called out to any other God. So it's God and nothing else. That's how the Radak explains it. Um, Rashi says, in my days, meaning in my days of challenge, in my days of concern, my solution has always been to call out to God, to ask God to help. Avafuni chevle moves, the, the pains of death encircle me, um sha'ol mitzauni, and the, 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 the straits of the depths find me, saravi agonemtsa, I find difficulty and despair. So, I mean, all these phrases are just for when, when life brings us great, great challenges. Really interesting shot to, to think about. The Radak says, sometimes the challenges find me, and sometimes I find the challenges. What does that mean, I find the challenges? So the Radak says, sometimes in life we, you know the phrase, be careful what you wish for? That's what the Radak says we're talking about here. That, that, that sometimes we work so hard whatever it is, you know, to get that job, to, to, to buy that house, to have that opportunity, whatever, and then it turns out to be such a disaster. But it, it, you know, in other words, sometimes the disaster finds us, sometimes we run full bore into it, just not realizing what we're running into. It's an interesting comment on life. Either way, whatever the problems are, v'shem Hashem ekra, I call out in the name of God, ano Hashem mal Please, God, save my soul. Chanun Hashem v'sadik. God is compassionate. Uh, the famous, famous idea that Rachum and Chanun are different words. They both loosely are translated as merciful or compassionate. But Chanun, which is the word used here, is related to Chinam. Chinam is for free. That, you know, sometimes we can turn to God and say, you know, I have some good things going for me. And I'm asking you to help me in this way. You don't have to help me, but if you help me, you're at least basing yourself on my good deeds. So that's God's being compassionate. Chanun is, we turn to God and say, I know that what I'm asking for, I have no deeds to account for what I'm asking for now. I'm just asking you to help me, just for the sake of helping me. Just totally, you know, without anything deserving on my part. That's Chanun. So on the one hand, God is compassionate, but interestingly enough, we also say, that God is tzaddik, that God is just. And the bottom line is, our God is compassionate. Shomer Sa'im Hashem, God guards the fools. Dalosi I have fallen low, and he will save me. The Radak explains. They, uh, the reason we're talking about fools here is everybody needs the salvation of God. But sometimes people, there's no logical reason why they should make it. There's no logical reason why they should survive. They have very little going for them. And yet, they, 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 they make it anyway. And that is, is the most striking example of, of God's helping people. But that's not the only example of God's helping people. Shuvi nafshi l'nuchoichi. Radak explains, when I find myself, when I find my soul in a situation of despair, I tell my soul, go back to a position of rest. Relax, calm down. Ki Hashem because God has done for you. So the point of the Pasuk is, even when things look dire and terrible, it could always turn around. <coughs> it could always be that God will help me. But the striking thing is the grammar of the Pasuk is in the past tense. The Radak says, the point is, I need to tell myself, God has helped me so many times before. I need to be calm because he has helped me so many times. So therefore, it's not a theoretical thing, maybe he'll help me. Why wouldn't he help me? He's helped me so many times before. Ki nafshi mimaves, you have saved my soul from death. As a nimindima, you have saved my eyes from tears. As ragli midachi, you have saved my foot uh, 
from stumbling. I forgive me. I, I just have to repeat. Uh, we had a wonderful scan of resonance over Shabbos, uh, Rabbi Mary Goldberg, and he quoted this. I can't remember which talk he quoted in, but I'll just say it very briefly. Mincha. Mincha. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, it's funny. I, I you know they have they're all these books out like you know sto- books of stories and this and that. So I actually. I read this story that he shared, and I believe it was attributed to him. Um, and as he's saying, wait a second, I read this, and what he said was almost as good as the version that it said in the book. <laughs> <laughs> almost as good. <laughs> but, uh, but I guess what he said was actually the correct version, so okay. But um, um, the story that he told, he was at a bar mitzvah, and I guess it was the grandfather of the bar mitzvah boy, was talking about the fact that whenever he said Hallel, he always found himself stumbling over this sentence, and he couldn't figure out what what was it about this sentence? I mean, the words are no more challenging here than any other sentence. And what he finally realized is that this pasuk was like told a very important part of his life. That when he was a young child, uh, he and his mother were uh, deported from the ghetto, and there was a line, uh, you know, men on this side, women on that side, and so this young child was on the women's side, and his mother knew that she was going to be killed. Mm-hmm. And if the child stayed with, him, with her, she would be, he would be killed. So she found a moment and she, when no one was looking, she had him hustle across the other side with the men. But once the guards realized that there's this little boy chick with the men, they would kill him anyway. So he did his best not to cry because he knew if he, would, if he would cry, it would attract the attention of the guards. And he did his best to stand on his tippy toes so he wouldn't look so young. And God miraculously helped him not cry. God miraculously helped him have the strength to keep on propping himself up. So, you've saved my soul from death. You've saved my eye from tear. You've saved my foot from stumbling. Mm-hmm. Really powerful. powerful. And you know, it's, 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 so that does a specific story, but it's 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 remarkable to think of how many how many people in one way or another can say that pasuk, whether it, it literally fits as well as that story, uh, that being saved by God. Es haleich l'vnei Hashem so sachayim. I will be able to walk before God in the land of the living. Um, the Radak says, Pshat, this pasuk, if you remember, we, we, we already explained that this chapter is a reference to David's experience fleeing from Shaul. So there was a time where David was hiding in the land of the Plishtim. And as he's hiding in the land of the Plishtim, he had confidence that the day would come where he'd be back in the land of the living, meaning back in his homeland in Israel. Interesting to think of this Pasuk. Again, you know, let's say like a Holocaust kind of context. The, the, the tremendous determination that allowed people to keep on living. It's interesting. It's just it's interesting to think about. Hemanti ki adaber ani anisimi od. This is always such a tough phrasing to understand. So the Radak explains it. Hemanti, I demonstrated great faith because I want to tell you something. Ani anisimi od. I've had great affliction, and. Despite the fact that I had great affliction, I still believed in God. For everything that I saw, I still believed in God. Ani amarti b'chavzi. I said in my, like, chavzi is like my, it's like a chaos, you know, my, my tremendous duress of running from one place to another. Kol ha'adam kosev. Every person is a liar. So I, the way I normally understand this, without any refreshment, the way I normally just say it when I'm when I'm when I am thinking about what I'm saying is is I need to become see kolad am kosev. It's just a statement of frustration, you know, like like I just reached the point where I said you know no one no one's no one's truthful. So let me tell you, the Radak says that the pshat is I said as I'm rushing from one place to another. By the way, is the same word as chipazon. The way the Jews left Egypt, you know, the rush in which the Jews left Egypt, people want another context. So as I'm running from one place to another, running for my life, I said that anyone who thinks I'm not going to ultimately become the king of Israel 
is a liar. They don't know what they're talking about. Because I was told that I would be the next king of Israel. So it doesn't matter that the cards seem completely stacked against me. It matters not. I, I, it's all going to be fine. And that's an expression of Hamanti, of the tremendous faith that I had, which was the Pasuk before. That's how the Radak explains it. Rashi says, as another um, expression of, of um, another expression of David's just great challenge, is I found in my life that you can't trust anyone. Here it is. Like, later in his life, his own son tries to rebel against him. This is a very different shot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the other shot that Rashi says is Shmuel the Navi, who told me that I would be the next king, obviously was lying. No, it can't be. So this is a very different shot than, than the Radak. So the Radak's shot is the expression of David's faith is that in the most challenging of times, he still says, I fully believe everything's going to happen. Rashi presumably would say that the expression of David's faith is not whether or not he believes that the prophecy that he'll be king will come true. You know what? Maybe it was difficult to see that the prophecy that he'd be king would come true. But the point is, regardless of the travails that he's experiencing, he still doesn't stop believing in God. What, you know, like whether or not in the small picture the specific prophecy would come to fruition, in the big picture, I've still got to do the right things, I've still got to be a servant of God. It's interesting, two very different ways of looking at it. Okay, let's keep on going. Remember, this is the same paragraph. It's, it's a remarkable shift from the previous sentence to this. However you understand the previous sentence, the David is saying, you know, it was so challenging, and, and whether it be that I didn't even believe I was going to be king, or whether it, believe it was a tremendous expression of my faith that I did believe I was going to be king, I've had so many wonderful things. He had so many wonderful things. He was running for his life different times. Mm -hmm. But it turned out okay. Isn't that an interesting story? You, it, it's an interesting statement about praise of God. It all has to do with what I focus on. You know, you could focus on the running, or you could focus on the survival. Mm -hmm. it, it brings to mind a very famous story. I believe it's told about Rabbi Eliezer Silver, um, who was, was very instrumental in bringing over Jews during the Holocaust and being involved with providing a solace to Jews after the Holocaust. So the story is told that he went to visit a DP camp and uh, he was visiting with people and there was a fellow who said to him, I can never believe in God. He said, why can you not believe in God? He said, because there was a fellow in the concentration camps who had a sitter. He, had, he, had his, he got his hands on a sitter. And what he would do is he would insist on significant portions of food from people in exchange for using his sitter. And so what a, what a terrible thing to hear it is a person's taking a prayer book and, and, and taking basic food from people that, that's the only way they'll, they'll keep on living. I can't believe in God. That such a, you know, that, and that's what a person of faith does. And Rabbi Silver said to me, looking at the wrong part of the picture, it's remarkable that what people were willing to give up to be able to pray from the sitter. It's, so it's a little, it's, 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 what are you going to focus on? So after all this stuff, it says, what can I give in, in, in payment to God for everything that you've done for me? Kos Yeshuos Esa, I raise the cup of salvation, Uvashem Hashem Ekra, and I will call out in the name of God. This idea of the cup of salvation the Radak says it could either be that cup is like a language of like my portion, like my share, so it's like we talk about like drinking the cup of your experiences type of thing, that when, when things go well for me, when, when, I'm, when I'm experiencing salvation, I'll call out on God's name, or it could be kos you know, when I'm celebrating, when I'm raising up the cup, celebrating my salvation, you know, okay. Nidarai la Hashem shalem, the vows to God, I will, I will pay them, in front of his whole nation. The Radak explains, you know, sometimes it's something that a person does when he's, when he's in danger. He says, God, if you save me, I'll do this, I'll do that. So all those things, whatever I vowed when I was on the run, I'm going to give it all now. 
Yakar Bene Hashem Hamavsa Lachasidav. It is very precious, very weighty in God's eyes, in God's eyes, the death of his pious ones. In other words, every every person who's a servant of God is precious to God. Anah Hashem ki ani avdecha. Please God, for I am your servant. Ani avdecha ben amosecha. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. Pitachta l'moseiroi. You have untied my bonds. The way I normally think of this pasuk when I'm reading it is, I just I'm turning to you, please, please God, please help me. I'm your, you know, I'm your faithful servant. The Radak says an interesting thing. The Radak says that part of my expression of thanks to you is the very fact that I'm your servant. It's the very fact that I'm your servant. The very fact that I'm giving your Torah and mitzvot, and I'm giving a way that you want me to lead my life. That in itself is a reason that I should be thanking you. And by the way, the, I'm sure I'm not the only one. The idea of, of I'm your servant, the son of your maidservant, just this basic, they are, whoever we are, whoever we are, those of us who have been born into Judaism, whoever we are, wherever exactly we're coming from, whoever our, our parents are, at the end of the day, we look at ourselves as God's servant, the child of his maidservant. There's something, I don't know if I'm saying it well, but there's something very powerful about that. Pitach to the most say, you have opened up my bonds. The Radak says, sometimes, this is such a powerful muscle for so many things, sometimes we think we're bound up, and we look down and we realize we, weren't, we, we were untied the whole time. So you've opened up my bonds. They, they, I, found, I thought I was in a situation that was hopeless, and you just snapped your fingers, and it, and it turns out that, that, that it was really, I wasn't bound at all. And there wasn't necessarily a dramatic moment that, that made it that it was no longer so. It just happened. But I see that as, as coming from you. It's an interesting thing to think about. To you, I will sacrifice an offering of thanks. V'shem Hashem And I'll call out in the name of God. Presumably, it's not only I'll say thanks to you, Presumably the idea of calling out the name of God is also spreading my belief in God and my understanding of God with other people. And uh, the Radak explains that we're saying it again for emphasis, that I, I'm really going to do this. I'm going I'm to pay back every vow that I have. You know, you, what comes to mind is so many times there are stories that when people are in dire situations, they beg and they plea and they, and they pray and they pledge. And then things go well and everything is fine. And they forget. And they forget. They forget. So there's a great emphasis here. On, 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 I'm going to pay every vow that even when things are going well, I'll look back and I'll see that it was really all from you. In the courtyard of God, within Jerusalem, yet again, there will be a cause for praising God. So... The bottom line is here we're talking about this parak is really all about the opportunity to look back at trials and travails and the fact that we survived this great, great cause for thanking God. And I mean we all we all have our own experiences that I think can relate to that in one way or another. Any comments or questions? If those first of all are this like really one par paragraph, then why do we omit one out of the two? when uncertain Yom Tov. I know you said how we have to, you know, just separate it. Right. But how did they pick those two paragraphs? So it seems, I mean, that's a good point. It seems that these two paragraphs, first of all, were a little bit on the longer side than a lot of the other ones. But they also felt that there was sort of a symmetry within these two paragraphs, specifically kind of a first part and a second part, and that you could still capture the basic gist in the second part with omitting the first part. So obviously there's something missing by not having the first part, but they felt like they weren't uh, omitting a significant part of the of the script, so to say. And the other paragraph, the low lano that we don't do? Same thing. No. Same thing. Okay. It's an interesting thing. It's a, I mean, there's also the ones kind of smack dab in the middle of the hollow, which I don't, I don't know if that made more sense for them to do it.
I don't know, maybe. I was thinking in the first paragraph a lot about your the time and being foolish. And that, that sentence is, it starts out acting like he's talking about somebody else, God walks over the foolish. And then he turns personal, but I'll you believe you Shia, that you saved me from going on the line. I'm thinking maybe the guy is really saying, you know, sometimes I, I do foolish things. And and they bring me down low that you saved me from it. And then I, I think you can even carry it through, you know, you can say, you delivered my soul from death. And sometimes I can be so foolish as to nearly have killed myself or died in, in an accident. And sometimes I was just so embarrassed by what I did that you saved my eyes from tears. And sometimes I could have been so injured that you saved my feet from stumbling. And so now I can still walk before Hashem because you saved me from having that. And then at the end when he says, I said in my haste all mankind is deceitful, maybe that was even the foolishness. Uh, it sort of all ties together. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'm a little confused on um, in the first part of it, the first paragraph. Hashem, you, you use the word in the land of the living, but it's the lands of the living. And I'm wondering, is that the whole earth? Is uh, in David's time? Or does that mean, because he's going, at the end, we just saw that he talks about Yerushalayim. So is it all of the Shvatim which are around Yerushalayim? I, I'm just. I'm, it could very well be. It's a very interesting. I'm just curious if he brings down anything. I see this in answer I don't know if he brings down anything. My initial idea was it's the whole world where people are living. Right. We are dispersed. Right. I mean, so the, it's an interesting thing why it says art so. So that's really what you're touching on the plural. Um, your comment about the Shvatim is an interesting comment that the lands, um, I mean, particularly if you, if you understand the verse as being David's perspective while he's on the run in the land of the Pushtim. So it's almost like, you know, if you get me back to Israel, the basic area where the Jews are, this part of Israel, that part of Israel, another part of Israel, just to be among the living. That, that's like what I would think, but I don't know if that's the shot, but it's, it's, it's an interesting point. So maybe it is what you were saying. I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, last point, Nancy. Um, I'm basing this comment on the other one. There's a couple of uses of the word gamal, which is, also means chesed, including um, gamal alaihi, and also another use of it. Gamal is, is, is kindness, but it um, comes from the word to wean, when you wean a child for nursing, and uh, that God's kindness extends to the extent that to make us independent, that we don't that in a way we, we don't need him every moment, you know, we need him every moment, but that we're able to exist as independent beings. Um, and I don't know if this is going a little bit too far with this explanation, but then David's troubles might have been a way that Hashem was teaching him to become more independent. Very well being. You know, so, I mean, though sometimes the most terrible things are also the things that make you grow and stronger. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go a little bit further. Halua um, Hashem Kol Goyim. Very interesting. So for all the chapters we've had here, this is a two-sentence chapter. Kuf Yud Zayin is two sentences. Halua Hashem Kol Goyim Shabchu Kol Homim. Praise God, all nations. You know, praise Him. Well, that seems to be pretty redundant. Ki gavar aleinu chasdo, because his kindness has overcome us. Ve'emes Hashem li'olam haluka. And God is truthful forever. Praise God. So two, two, two verses, and that's it. So the Radak says a, a, a really interesting point, that there's two ways to relate to God. And both are very valuable. You can relate to God as any member of the human race should relate to God. Or you can relate to God as the Jewish people should relate to God. And we believe in both. The Jewish people have a little bit more of a specified way of relating to God in terms of the Torah, uh, in terms of we have a a little bit of a more unique historic connection to God, you know, in terms of events. But the bottom line is, all of mankind should be able to relate to God. So there's two verses. One for all of mankind, and one for specifically the Jewish people. Halus Hashem kol goyim. Let all the nations of the world praise God. Shabchul kol omim. 
That's mankind. Because his kindness has overcome us, it's a little bit more specified. Vemes Hashem, Hashem frequently is understood as being the Jewish God, you know, the God of a connection to the Jews, Leolam. And God is, is always truthful, so it's an interesting pshat. It's an interesting way of thinking about these two verses. Um, the Kigavar Leinu Chasto, they have his kindness has overcome us. The Radak says, they have, how many people could never really wrap their mind around God really being able to redeem the Jewish people? You know, how, how many people, you know, in their heart of hearts said, how is this ever going to get any better? How is it ever going to really be fully resolved in Israel? How is that going to happen? How could it happen? The day will come, Kigavar Oleinu Chasto. They are his kindness overpowers us, you know, kind of uh, mesmerizes us, takes us to a place that we never thought we could go. That, that's what the Radak says. Um, Hashem and God is truthful forever. What's this truthfulness? The Radak says, we know that God tells the Jewish people, even after the Tochacha, even after the very harsh rebuke, I'll remember my covenant with the patriarchs, and I'll remember the land. So that, you know, through thick and thin, through all the twists and turns of Jewish history, the day will come when the full redemption comes, we will say, wow, that promise was always true. Span the generations, but it ultimately happened. And now, <coughs> well, this is really the beginning of a whole new chapter, but we'll just do the first four verses. But by the way, just, just to talk about the, the basic dynamic here, so, Hodul Hashem Kito, Kilam Chasto, is a person is speaking to a group. Hodu is in the plural. One person says to the masses, You should praise God, for He is good, for His kindness is eternal. So, that's the reason why we do it in Shul. The Chazan says it, and then everyone responds, Hodul Hashem Kito, Kilam Chasto. By the way, the normal practice is the congregation kind of quickly whispers the next sentence. Well, the Chazan is saying this because we don't want to skip. I mean, this is part of Halal. But the response to the Chazan's each line is again this, Hodul Hashem Kito Kilam Chasto. You know, just wait if you, if you don't mind. Um, so much so that there's an idea that if a person, let's say, is, is a little bit behind, let's say you're in Shul, so there are people around, but you're behind, they're, they're, they're laying already. And you're, you're saying, Halal, there's actually an idea of you going up to two people. I've, I've seen this before. Um, and you say to them, kito kilom and they're supposed to respond. So, so there's, again, if, if you're davening by yourself, it's certainly fine, you know, to just, just say the second. There's no reason to repeat hodul Hashem kito to yourself. Um, though I am reminded of what my, my grandfather, Lava Shalom, used to say, uh, my mother's father, what my mother's father used to say, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me when I speak to myself. It concerns me when I speak to myself and then I ask, what did you say? That's when I get worried. So, so you don't have to speak to yourself with this. Um, that's not my father's father kind of, you know, but, uh, but uh, um, the Radak gives two general possibilities. One is that these psukim here are referring to specifically the coronation of David as king, or in general, the, the redemption of the Jewish people. So, <coughs> so let's assume it's talking about the redemption of the Jewish people. So, when the Jewish people ultimately are redeemed, we should turn to each other and say, give praise to God for he is good, for his kindness is eternal. That once the ultimate redemption comes, it'll be forever. That's the, how the Radak says to Pshahat. Um, Rav Hirsch has a very nice idea. Rav Hirsch says, that, you know what, Kili Alam Chasto is regardless of what's going on. His kindness is eternal. We might see the kindness in the moment. We might not really understand the kindness in the moment. But either way, we have to say God is kind. God is good. It's forever, no matter what's going on. We, there we have to believe there's a kindness there. Yomar na Yisrael Kili Alam Chasto, let the Jewish people say that his kindness is eternal. Yomruna veis Aaron kililam chasto. Again, this subset, you know, the Kohanim, let them say 
that his kindness is, is, is eternal. Let those specifically who have a special reverence for God proclaim that his kindness is eternal. Um, and on this, the Radak says that for people who really live their life with a reverence in God, any wonderful thing is an opportunity to praise him. So just like, like when things go well, that's an opportunity to say praise to God. Any comments, questions? Sarah, did you want to say something? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Aaron? It's actually on an earlier one. Someone has a So, okay, so, uh, Stuart? Well, do you have that Yisrael Aron Yireh Hashem again? Mm -hmm. uh, right, it's, it's a recurring, it's a recurring, I mean, it seems to be different sections of the Jewish people. And as we learned earlier tonight, though, it's possible that Yireh Hashem might not even be Jews. It's possible that Yireh Hashem are people who have true belief in God of other, of other, of other nations. It's possible. Interesting thing. Aaron, so why don't you, why don't you? Okay. Um, this is in the paragraph of Ahavti. Mm -hmm. At the end, when it says, Ani Amati Bechovzi Kol Adam Kozei, it reminds me of the same Kol Adam at the end of Kohelis. When you say, Sof Tavar Kol Bishma, it's in the Yerlis Mishos of Shemot, Kizek Kol Adam. Over there, it's used to define a person. The definition of a person is to, you know, in terms of his pursuit, his, you know, the mankind's pursuit, to fear God, to the mitzvah. Yeah. So I think maybe what's going on here is I said in my haste, I shortchanged mankind, that the, the definition of a person is, is deception. Maybe a little bit here and there, but it's not the, not the definition. definition. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? Ray? Uh, I forget where I heard this from, but someone said that in some ways the Goyim have a better ability to praise Hashem because ki gavar leina pasto, for what he's done for us, because there's certain things that confirm stories. So we knew about what Haman planned, right. and then we knew to give praise. Right. But there's so many other plans that we never knew about that Hashem behind the scenes prevented us, pr prevented it from ever becoming something that we didn't even know about. The point is, wow, Hashem prevented even that from happening. Thank you very much. I don't remember where I I heard also that. have heard that before. I also don't remember from where I heard that. But, <laughs> but, but, it's, a, but it's, a, it's a very, it's a, and unfortunately, I think we can appreciate how true it is. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Stuart, I think I wanted to make an announcement. Oh, um, one more week of this Hala class is next Monday night. Then there'll be a, a week off, and then starting December 14th and 21st, we'll start the Be a Better Volatile class, which is, uh, we'll start with a, a lecture or two by Rabbi Rosenbaum on the Hala and the process and the mindset and all of or about Kula. Um, and then when we both welcome to the class, um, and then that will be followed by Rabbi Burnham, actually with a hands-on, direct, how to daven, Shabbat Shabbat, from Menta through Shabbat through, uh, we're talking to Menta, I mean, Gemara, and then Menta. Uh, and that'll take several more weeks. So just so you know, that's what's coming. Uh, there have been suggestions for other classes following that, and we will be in touch with that.